Hi, I'm Sarah Meister. I am the executive director of Aperture, who is thrilled to have co-published Dawood Bay Elegy with the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Um, on behalf of Lydia and APAD and Aperture as a programming partner, we are thrilled to wrap, to welcome all of you and to wrap up the programming with what is sure to be the highlight of, the, of a very competitive uh, weekend for great programming. So we are honored to have with us Valerie Cassell Oliver, the Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and Dawood Bay, a MacArthur Grant uh, winner, an educator, a leader, an activist, and also an Aperture trustee, very close to my heart. So. Without further ado, welcome, thank you both, and here we go. Thank you. Thank you. So I, uh, good morning. I, good morning, my dear. How are you? We get to do this all over again. Uh, yep. but, and thank you all, thank you all for being here. Yes, absolutely. Before we start, I also want to congratulate you on your recent election into the Academy, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which is... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Really, really um, quite a profound contributor to the history of what's happening in this country and certainly to the field of photography and the field of arts Thank in general. You. So given the fact that we've often had these conversations in art museums uh, that were specifically photography related, since we are here uh, at APAD, I thought we would start with the history of photography. Um, oftentimes uh, we discuss Elegy, the exhibition itself, in terms of a socio-historical context. Um, but let's talk about photography and the history of photography, and when and where you are positioning yourself within that landscape itself. Uh, you often talked about the making of Night Coming Tenderly Black and the making of In This Here Place, the photographic series that comprise uh, Elegy and Stony the Road as your contributions to the history and the landscape photography can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, uh, certainly I'm very uh, steeped in the history of photography and have been uh, since I became serious about making photographs. But even when I first had the idea to make photographs, I started going out looking at a lot of photographs, trying to uh, get a sense of the work that resonated for me, and I guess the work that I wanted to, even though I wouldn't have framed it that way at the time, the work I wanted to be in conversation with. And one of the earliest shows that I went to see uh, in 1977. Uh, I went to uh, the Marlboro Gallery to see uh, Irving Penn, small trade photograph. Uh, and I returned to Marlboro Gallery to see, uh, around that same time, uh, the Richard Avedon exhibition. And uh, probably also around that time, and we're talking mid to late 1970s. I got interested in photography seriously around 1975. Uh, I went to MoMA and saw a very small exhibition of Mike Disfarmer's photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Disfarmer, uh, studio photographer from Herbert Springs, Arkansas. And I was looking at a lot of other things, too. I remember going to uh, the big Harry Callahan show at the Met. I loved Harry Callahan's work. Uh, it didn't particularly strike me as work that I wanted to necessarily be in conversation with, but I loved that work. 
and took it on as part of my uh, self-education process. And piece by piece, just looking at work and beginning to take note of the works that resonated for me as I was trying to figure out uh, what my own subject matter would be. And uh, the first project that I took on was uh, Harlem, USA, uh, starting in 1975. And I always, I've always seen the work as being both a conversation about the things that I'm interested in, uh, as well as being in conversation with and contributing something to or disrupting or adding to the larger history. So I've, I've never felt that I'm just out in the street making pictures. Mm -hmm. I have a kind of uh, a, a serious awareness that I'm operating inside of a particular history and trying to consider how I want to engage it, uh, the vocabularies coming out of that history that I want to uh, adopt for my own purposes and for making my own work. You know, because I, I think uh, vocabularies and languages, once they're adopted, can be used to talk about anything. You know, and I wanted to use that history and those languages of certain kinds of picture making to talk about uh, the both visible and the not so visible uh, black presence in the American landscape, both through portraits and now more recently uh, through the unseen but very present uh, presence of uh, black subjects embedded in the American landscape. So history has always been the frame that I've operated and made work inside of. Well, it's, it's um, we Even if it wasn't always the literal subject of the work, in a way it was. Right, because it's about place and it's about community and the disappearance of communities yeah. uh, and the erasure that one. Yeah, because one Harlem, USA, I was in Harlem because of my mother and father's history there. Right. So I was kind of, in a way, looking to engage my own family's history by returning to a place where that history had transpired. So both history and ways of thinking about picture making uh, have always been present in, in my work from the very beginning. Well, an elegy is an exhibition which comprises those three series, the trilogy, comes out of what I have begun to think about as the confluence of both this intent about history, making history visible, which starts with the Birmingham mm -hmm. project, uh, and then Harlem Redux, which is a way of dealing with erasure, uh, again, with this sort of landscape photography, but an urban landscape. So I see the kind of, mm -hmm. the, the mm -hmm. melding of those two, and the sort of development of perspective, uh, which starts to become very, very present in Night Coming Tenderly Black, which involves the absence of the black body, the absence of bodies, period. Yeah. It's kind of the simultaneous absence and presence, which is the way I think about the work uh, conceptually, you know, is making the unseen visible. Because, uh, I mean, every place, you know, there was a book I read a long time ago by Pete Hamill, I can't remember the exact title of it, but for those of you who are New Yorkers, you probably know the writer Pete Hamill, one of the daily newspaper writers, Pete Hamill, Jimmy Breslin, those populist writers about primarily the New York American uh, experience. And uh, Hamill wrote a book about his childhood. And the thing that he said in that book that I most remembered, he said that, the deeper meaning and the true meaning of every place lies in what it was and what it is. And I always remember that because whenever I'm someplace, I'm both thinking about the reason that I'm there now, but when I'm on 42nd Street and Park Avenue, 
I remember going through the automat on that corner mm -hmm. with my mother. Mm -hmm. And that's what that place means to me, regardless of what I'm there for now. So this idea of history being a kind of ever-present, yet sometimes unseen thing to give context and meaning to experience is you know, something that uh, I think a lot about. You know, I, I think about it, I mean, I mean, look where we're sitting. You know, th this is clearly a place of history. You know, this place has a history and a meaning quite different from the meaning that we're giving to it right now. You know, and to me, that's what it means is to sit here in this army. It's that plus this conversation, you know. So I really believe that that, that notion uh, that Hamlet described of the true and deeper meaning of a place lying in what it was and what it is. And figuring out over the course of my work and career how to give different and resonant form to those ideas through the medium that I've chosen to work uh, in primarily. Uh, photography, moving from what would be called, you know, portrait-based work to now uh, making work that's more in conversation with the long tradition of the American landscape, yeah. going all the way back to the Western survey photograph, Absolutely. which I think is our first encounter with the landscape and photography, those Western survey photographs, and then moving forward in that history. And, uh, no, one, one of the things that I think is interesting, uh, I, I recently moved into a smaller apartment, and so I had to pack up all my books and unpack them and reshelve them. And one of the things that I kind of surprised myself about was exactly the books that I had, uh, because I have probably every Emmett Gowan book even some that most people don't even know. I have every Joel Sternfeld. I have every, you know, all of the great landscape photographers, even though I wasn't necessarily making work within that genre, uh, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've looked deeply at that work, you know, and I have, uh, a sense of exactly what that work is. And then, of course, I have all the great portrait photographers, too, you know. So this idea of having uh, the resources and the ability to fluidly kind of move through different languages of picture making uh, as necessary for uh, where I am. But I was kind of surprised. Uh, I knew I had the book, but I hadn't looked at them in so long. And then to see exactly what I had and how those books now relate very strongly to the work that I'm doing at this moment, when they didn't, when I got them. Well, it stays with you. And, and this notion of the compression of time, I, I want to stick with that because you brought that up. And it's something that also appears very prominently in the book. This idea that space, space, they say space forgets you, but space never forgets you. There is a, a what we would consider a haunting of space. Mm -hmm. Even when we're not aware that there are layers of history that we stand upon. And that's something that really comes very strongly throughout the work that you've created throughout these three series. Um, much more so than the Birmingham Project, which was about place and people, and yeah. the imagining but Birmingham, of... But the Birmingham work was the first time that I began to consider how to visualize a specific past and time. in the contemporary moment, and to create this kind of liminal space and place through the work. That was both past. And, and present. present. Exactly. And with the Birmingham work, doing that through the portrait and the diptychs of young people who were the ages of those killed, and then portraits of those who were the ages that they would have been, and then putting them together. It was very much about the past, but it was also very much made 
in the contemporary moment. And I think the Birmingham work is what really uh, set the conceptual frame for all of the work that's come after in terms of create, using the work to create this sense of liminality, a sense of past and present. Yes, but these photographs that you created in this trilogy feel timeless. They feel, in a way, we're looking at this image from the series in this here place. Uh, this is of, of Evergreen. There are five plantations, but primarily Evergreen and the Whitney. Yeah, Evergreen, um, uh, the Whitney. Um, Laurel. Um, uh, I'm sitting here right now, I can't remember, but yeah, five plantations right. up and down River Road. Laurel and Oak Alley. Yeah. Um, I don't remember, Deshaun. Well, uh, there are five of them. Right. Uh, and Normal. yes. And then there's the film. There's also the filmic elements of it, which I don't want to get into right now because I want to talk more or less about the photography itself and the space, which is both present but of course alludes to the past and understanding what these spaces are. Oftentimes, and we commission of the series Stony the Road, which is along the, um, um, the slave trail, the historic slave trail in Richmond, Virginia, which I don't think a lot of people even realize the, the magnitude, the significance mm -hmm. of this space. There have been times I've gone along the trail and I've seen people running along the trail, not realizing that, uh, or maybe realizing, what, what I don't know. Where that is. Yes, the resonance of the, the sanctity of this space where people were literally marched into bondage. You know, people are using it as a, as a trail to run uh, when it really is a, a place of, should be a place of deep meditation and, and, and um, a sacred space. Uh, and I think you brought, these are some of the images from Stony the Road, you brought a real sense of um, meditation and, and uh, brought the kind of profundity of the space, you know, back into question, uh, which I, I truly love uh, because it is remarkable of that conflation of time and how. Yeah, and what I'm, when I'm in these spaces, I mean, I'm clearly in these spaces in the present moment, but I'm trying to look at them, to imagine them as, and to see them as through the past. I'm thinking more about what those landscapes meant mm -hmm. at the moment that the black presence was physically there and trying to evoke that uh, through the photograph to make them from the vantage point of the past even as I stand in the present moment. And one of the ways in which I do that is by making these photographs from an eye level vantage point, from a human level vantage point, uh, which is also meant to suggest the black bodies that were once present in those landscapes, looking out into and experiencing those landscapes and their moment, and providing a way for the viewer through the photograph to kind of re-inhabit those moments. And the absence of any uh, clues uh, from present. the present, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which are definitely there. You know, like when Ansel Adams was photographing, the parking lot was behind him. His, his truck was parked behind him. But the purpose of the work was not to show that, right. but was to get you to believe this. So for me, you know, just making work in a way that doesn't give any obvious clues or evidence of the present moment, and also materially making the work in black and white, because black and white is the material of photography's past, you know, and the scale of the work begins to suggest the physical scale of the landscape. And if you stand close to the work, you begin to, in a way, inhabit that landscape. The, the world around you is momentarily blocked out. 
mm -hmm. and you exist in the space of the photograph, the space of the past. Uh, and, I, and I've had some, uh, one very interesting experience when the work was uh, shown in a museum context for the first time. And I happened to come walking into the gallery with uh, Matt Rutkowski, the head of the photography department uh, at the Art Institute. And two people were there looking at the work and uh, they were standing very close to the work. They were deeply engrossed in the work. And when I walked in and they saw me, they were momentarily startled mm -hmm. uh, in a very interesting and unusual way. Because then one of the women turned to me and she said, but you made these, right? You, you made these, you know? Like she was in this place that was clearly a place that the photographs had drawn her into the past, and now she's seeing me being startled back into the present moment, because since I made them, it must be. And, and I, words. yeah, and I, and I uh, tried to help her along. You know, I said, <laughs> yes, I made them. I made them in 2012. And I very quickly <laughs> started talking and to get them back into this moment. But, uh, I don't often have the opportunity to see uh, that directly, the evidence of how people are engaged in the work. Well, but that's my intention, for the work to almost inextricably pull you into a place of the past. Well, you have the um, example of that in Stephen Dater's booth, because the large scale photographs are 44 by 55. They're very large, so they're almost portals into which people are stepping into a past. And again, the vantage point is that of the human eye level. So you're literally placed within the scene of being among the bushes and looking out toward these homes that would be safe homes along the Underground Railroad, or a clearing that you know you would have to trans, you know, um, you know um, cross in order to get to a, a you know, coverage of safety. But there is something about that series, Night Coming to Durley Black, uh, which is a masterclass in printing, too, because it's the black of black, it's the materiality of the photograph. It's so dark, you literally have to stand in front of it for allowing certain things to become visible to you. So it's easy to get completely in, you know, enthralled into the experience of seeing. Uh, which is again a nod to the yeah, that, that work was uh, directly uh, inspired by the photographs of Roy G. Carava, yes. who was uh, one of my earliest and most enduring influences. And uh, I'm sure at least some of you here are familiar with uh, Roy G. Carava's work, but they uh, primarily worked about the black subject. and. Uh, they are realized through the very dark print and spaces. So you have this kind of uh, blackness that is the subject, blackness that is the narrative, and then blackness that is also the photographic object. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, Roy's work has uh, both informed and inspired me for a long time. And the work that I did uh, and Night Coming Tenderly Black came directly out of wanting to attach that rich materiality to this idea of black fugitivity and moving through the northeastern Ohio landscape under cover of darkness. Uh, the photographs weren't made under cover of darkness. Yep. Any more so than most of Roy's photographs were not made under cover of darkness. Uh, that darkness and that blackness is an idea that's realized in the photograph. And uh, I will say that that work was probably the most labor intensive, uh, difficult, uh, work uh, 
that I've uh, ever done, especially at that scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the able assistance of my printer who is sitting right <laughs> here. Uh, a lot of back and forth in terms of the density, tonality, mm -hmm. how to get black on black on gray on gray on gray, and to, to really use the two-dimensional surface of the photograph, you know, to create uh, this illusion of spatial depth. Because mm -hmm. photographs, I think we all know, photographs are flat. I mean, I don't think that, I don't think I'm telling you anything new by saying that. They're, they're the world flat, is flat. Two dimensional <laughs> objects. Yes, yes. And, you know, one of the wonderful things that photographs have to do, have, uh, can do, is when one uses the material, and especially the material of the silver gelatin print, in which the silver. Uh, halides are actually very thinly, but they're embedded in the paper, as opposed to uh, a digital pigment print where the ink sits on top of the paper. It, it's a very different kind of material uh, experience. And that fact of the silver halide being embedded in the paper presents an opportunity to push the spatial Further. illusion mm -hmm. uh, of uh, the space even further, which for me was both, you know, about a certain object quality, but also about a certain uh, quality in relation to the narrative. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you haven't uh, been able to see these large photographs in the group. There is one here uh, at APAD hanging in a Stephen Data's booth. Mm -hmm. If you uh, want, want to get a look in Stephen Data gallery, you, you can see exactly uh, what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and what's really amazing about this series tonight coming tenderly black is a lot of people will assume that you photographed it in darkness because of, as you say, the printing is so crisp on it, but it also gives a sort of um, a kind of um, physicality of the eye because the eye can't make things legible even in the space of darkness. The physical eye, if we're, we're standing in darkness, we can make legibility of some things. But of course you couldn't do that with the camera. The camera is not yeah. the human eye. It doesn't yeah, and that fill was, you in. Know, you know, since, since we're in a photography context, uh, I, do, I still photograph on film. And as you know, once you get all of the information in the film, there's infinite ways that you can print that. There is no right way to print it. The right way to print it is the right way that's, you know, consistent with the intention and the narrative of whoever's making the photograph. So, yes, these photographs were not uh, photographed uh, at nighttime because there's no way that you could go out photographing at nighttime and get all of that material information. Mm -hmm. So the photographs are made during different times of the day. And then in the printing, because I wanted in the final print to have not only the darkness, but the rich materiality to give them a sense of place, to be able to not only see this path of fugitivity in the landscape, but to feel the materiality of the landscape, which requires getting all of that information in the negative in the first place. Because if you're tempted to do that uh, at, at nighttime, you know, you would have something that's very grainy. And I believe in having, you know, a richly descriptive object. And if you did it digitally, there would be a certain amount of noise. It, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to get all of the information to work with. So, uh, yeah, night, night coming tenderly black. It was a, a very ambitious project, both conceptually and uh, materially. But Not it, something I would take on every day. No. <laughs> but, but it did give us an opportunity. It did give us an opportunity to begin to think about what it meant in terms of bringing a particular narrative together 
Um, when I saw Night Coming Tenderly Black, I immediately thought, and hearing you talk about it at the Art Institute, I immediately thought about my, the place where I inhabited, which was Richmond, Virginia, being at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and knowing that there was a narrative that became the, the, the preface or the beginning of what Night Coming Tenderly Black had become, which is the last stages along the Underground Railroad. Here we had the opportunity to talk about the entrance into bondage. And when we first started talking about it, I thought, well, this could be a, a wonderful project to have these two bookends. But you were already in New Orleans working on In This Here Place. So it made sense to create a trilogy to talk about the beginning into bondage, you know, labor, what that meant to be physically in bondage, and then self-emancipation. So hence, the sort of uh, elegy comes, comes into being. What's beautiful about it is as you, as you talk about um, photography, the physicality of photography, and the idea of creating the things that exist in the spaces and the slippages, it conceptually translates into talking about the slippages of history and what we have to somehow fill in the blanks for the things that we do not know we do not know all of the stories that happen for those walking into bondage. We do not know all of the stories as it pertains to life living on plantations. But it, it offers a space of what they call, Sadia Hartman calls critical confabulation, that we can begin to fill in some of the gaps, which is where I want to talk about your interest in literature and how literature plays a role in helping to shape what the photographs look like and what the narratives that visually become constructed began to take shape in these series. Yeah, but the, the other thing I, I wanted to back up and, and, and point out too, you know, because all of the work that I'm doing, I'm making the work to participate in a conversation is that the making of the work always requires for me a certain infrastructure in order to amplify the work. You know, in none of these history-based projects have I just gone to a place mm -hmm. and made photographs. You know, the Birmingham project came out of a conversation that I initiated with the Birmingham Museum of Art. Right. And uh, the work was ultimately exhibited there, but the, uh, the museum also became the infrastructure and my way into the community. Uh, and uh, the plantation work in this here place uh, came out of a conversation with Prospect uh, in New Orleans. And I had already started the work, but Prospect gave me an infrastructure to attach the work to a larger conversation about history in Louisiana. Uh, the Night Coming Tenderly Black uh, came out of an invitation to uh, participate in the Front Triennial in Cleveland, which then provided uh, a structure and a framework, both of support and presentation for the work. Uh, and then, of course, the Stony the Road work, you know, came out of uh, our conversation and ultimately uh, an invitation to make work uh, on the slave prayer uh, in Richmond, around which uh, there already had been conversations taking place. Uh, that uh, the making of the work helped to use the museum as a platform to elevate those conversations. And the whole institutional conversation for me uh, has always been important. Because uh, even when I completed my very first project, Column USA, I wanted to show that work and did show that work at the Studio Museum in Harlem because I wanted the people who were the subject of the photographs to also have access 
to the photograph uh, as part of the audience for the work through an institution that was situated in the community. So this institutional uh, conversation has probably, for me, been as important as the historical conversation. Yeah, uh, I mean, none of these. Because I have, I, have, you know, I have a whole set of ideas about you know, the ways in which artists and institutions and museums can engage uh, in a conversation of ideas that results uh, in the bringing you know, out of uh, new work. So the institutional piece of it is very much the larger frame. Yeah, no, I, I don't want to flatten it. I mean, for certainly for Stony the Road, that was years in the making. So it wasn't that Dawood came into Richmond and just suddenly started photographing the slave trail. It didn't happen yeah, that way. But I never there did. were a number of conversations with people who were stakeholders, uh, a number of times to go through and look at the space and to begin framing how to present it. So none of these things happen in a vacuum, nor, neither do they happen. Uh, suddenly, but you do have your own intentionality of how and when you go into these spaces. I mean, which I'm not invited to come in. I was not invited mm -hmm. to the shoots at all, by the way. Um, but there's, um, there's a space where, again, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how do we contribute to the slippages of what we don't know and how literature provides a, a beautiful template mm -hmm. of moving through there and how you, you began to um, see that what happens in the literary as an opportunity to contribute on a visual scale and within the visual context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's, and it's a way of engaging in a conversation around uh, how artists and in institutions can come together to make things. You know, because I never, I never consider the exhibitions that I do to be merely an exhibition. The, the exhibition results out of a process, out of a conversation, mm -hmm. uh, out of a highly intentional conversation, conversation around shared interests. Uh, you know, your invitation to go to Richmond, coming out of your awareness of the work that I was doing and how this might, in fact, contribute and add something to the work that I was in the midst of. Uh, for me, that, that, uh, that's an important part of the work. You know, even the project that I'm thinking about now, which I can't actually begin until I figure out the infrastructure part, because I don't want to just go there and make work. I want to go there and make work that contributes to a conversation that I know is happening there. Mm -hmm. But I need to find and build the relationship and then build an infrastructure that will allow me to make work inside of that. Because I could just go there tomorrow and make photographs, but that, that's not what I want the work to do, and that's not the way I think about the work. You know, the work is part of a larger, for lack of a better word, transformative conversation, mm -hmm. how to build an infrastructure for transformation an infrastructure for extending conversations that exist that I can also participate in, or that I can participate in, maybe sprinkle a little bit of gasoline around to, to amplify these conversations. Uh, so I, I, um, I want to sort of wrap it uh, nicely. Let's talk quickly about film and uh, the yeah. shifting of the dynamic of the static image into a moving image now. Yeah, I, uh, I, I guess for several years I kind of considered myself a closet filmmaker. Uh, I took film all through grad school with a great filmmaker by the name of Michael Roma. I don't know if some of you know Michael Roma. He did a breakout film called Nothing But a Man with uh, Ivan Dixon and Abby Lincoln in the 1960s. And uh, Roma taught film at Yale, kind of like forever. Uh, <laughs> and I knew about him before I got there. And one of my intentions was definitely to study both filmmaking 
on film theory mm -hmm. because you did a making class, you did a theory class, you did a history class. Michael pretty much was the film department uh, at Yale. Uh, but uh, I guess the films come out of, first of all, the, the realization that as much information and context that we can layer into photographs, there's probably a lot more things that they don't do than they actually do. You can't hear them. You know, they don't move. They don't, you know, they're very specific in their own way uh, materially. And I wanted to begin to uh, engage that history in yet another way, to find a way to talk about it, both through the moving image and then to layer that sonically as another way of amplifying and visualizing and uh, bringing this history to life. Mm -hmm. So the first one that I did was 9 uh, in conjunction uh, at the same time as the Birmingham Project photograph. And usually the way I work is to complete uh, the picture making photography piece of the project, get to work on that, take a break, and then come back and begin the filmmaking piece of it with a crew uh, that I've uh, already assembled. Uh, I was able to put together a film crew in uh, Birmingham, uh, six foot four production, uh, because the producer of uh, that company was Six foot, foot tall, four. six foot four. <laughs> so they ended up becoming <laughs> six foot four. Uh, and then uh, in Richmond, I had the very good uh, fortune to work with uh, Spang TV, a great film production house uh, in, uh, in Richmond. Uh, I brought in my director of photography, Brian Moy who had worked on the three-channel uh, film Evergreen, uh, asked Bond if he knew anyone in Richmond. And it turns out that whole southern region uh, community of filmmakers, it seems they all know each other. Yeah. And uh, Bond recommended me to the folks at Spain. Uh, and I, I think I actually interviewed two different possible producers, and Spang and Jordan Roderick, as the producer at Spang, uh, felt right for me. You know, I have, a, I have a background in music, so I've been in a number of uh, different bands, and I see putting together a film crew as kind of like being in a band. You know, it's three, four, five, six, however many people, working together to make something. And there can't be any off personalities in that. Because at some point, it's almost like a family. You're working with each other every day to make something. Somebody has to be the band leader, but in truth, you can't make the music without everybody being brilliant at whatever their piece of it is. So uh, Brian was able to put me in touch with Jordan. And uh, through Jordan, uh, did the film production. And then, I mean, Richmond turned out to be with, uh, well, it turned out to be very rich in resources yes. because uh, there was a studio there, Paul Bruski, yes. at Engineer Studio, uh, who became uh, the sound designer and the, the engineer for what became the sonic uh, soundtrack, uh, as well as... Uh, Janelle Sherrod, uh, choreographer, dancer, who Valerie introduced me to once I described to her uh, my idea for the soundtrack, uh, soundtrack being based on the imagined sound of 350,000 pairs of feet in this one space. Mm -hmm. And if you could overlay the sound of 350,000 feet 
what might that sound like, mm -hmm. along with ambient sound, and then sound that came out of the history of this African, now African-American presence in the American landscape. Mm -hmm. what, what might that ultimate cacophony of sound, if you could layer it, layer it, layer it, and have a cacophony that was still sonically distinct so that you could hear the pieces of it, but that it be rooted in the sound, the imagined sound of 350,000 pairs of feet moving through that landscape that the film also moved through with the steady cam and that the photograph uh, visualized. So the moving image and sound for me, which I certainly intend to continue exploring further, it just allows for a different kind of sensory expansion of the idea, a way to draw the viewer into the experience uh, in a way that is different from what uh, still photographs do. Mm -hmm. They're related because it still has four sides, it's still lens-based, you know, which I understand. But then to make that move, you know, and in 350,000, the movement through the space is meant to suggest the movement of those 350,000 black bodies through this new and unfamiliar space. Mm -hmm. So it moves, it looks around, it's yeah. trying to take it all in. Well, it's, as you say, it's the liminal space and it's the psychic space that exists, that, that thing that we feel that's just below the surface that sometimes seeps upward, that we feel but we can't always give a context or a name for. So I think both in Evergreen and in 350,000, that sense of animating those spaces really allows the, the hauntedness, the hauntology, if I will, you know, to come to the fore. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so for, those of you, for those of you are in New York wondering when you will ever get a chance to see this, uh, I'm going to be showing uh, the new photographs and this two-channel film work, 350,000. Here in New York at Sean Kelly Gallery. Right. In, uh, in, in January, is that right, Jeffrey? In January. Mm -hmm. So keep, keep your eyes and ears out. Right. The work is coming to New York. And, and while the exhibition has closed in Richmond, Virginia, we do have a stunning book, thanks to um, the collaboration with Aperture and Eileen, who is somewhere in the audience, Eileen Boxer who did an exceptional job in designing the book. There you are, darling. Um, so I don't know if this is a good place to sort of open it up to conversation uh, with the audience, but yes. And you'll, you'll have to bear with me. My ears are not working at all, so you <laughs> okay. ask the question, Chill. Okay. Chill, okay. tell me what you're, what you're asking. Thank you. I was curious about what his intentions were with the white picket fence, the gray picket fence, and the ebony black fence that I saw in some of these images. Maybe I'm just seeing something, but I'm curious if there's symbolism or if there was an intention behind that. Oh. So with the use of night coming tenderly black, um, he was asking about the fences that seem to appear in the photographs themselves, and is there any specific intentionality in the white picket fence versus the gray versus the Well, I think when I think about, not even in this context, but I think the first photograph of a white picket fence in a house that I ever saw was Paul Strand. So if the photograph of the picket fence makes you think about Paul Strand, you're not wrong. <laughs> that, you're not wrong at all. Uh, but uh, in the photograph that's here and in some other cases, uh, this idea, well, the fact and the idea of the emergence in the American landscape of the white picket fence and what that has come to mean about uh, a particular kind of American experience 
and the demarcation of a certain kind of American landscape, you know, domestic landscape, you know. The, the white picket fence appears throughout uh, American culture, American social culture. Uh, and it means all kinds of things. But the first photograph that I made in the Night Come and Tend to the Black project was that particular house with the white picket fence because all of the work that I do is very uh, research-based at first. I mean, I do a lot of Google street walking around places before I even get there, mm -hmm. uh, type in, you know, known, you know, uh, underground railroad site, see what comes up, try to find an address, put that address in the Google Street View, walk around, walk up the block, go around the corner, you know, all at my desk, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so the work is very research-based. And when I saw that particular house, the first one, uh, on Google Street Walk, and knowing that that block was definitely a block that contained uh, what were called underground railroad station houses in which, you know, fugitive African Americans would take temporary refuge uh, before, in this case, moving on to Lake Erie uh, in Cleveland. So, yeah, it's both a part of that narrative of fugitivity, but it's also a part of the long history of the white picket fence uh, in, in, in photographs. It means something different here because of what that house is. Mm -hmm. Now, interestingly enough, when my assistant and I showed up at this house, uh, the owner was very receptive. They knew the history. They even had some underground railroad brochures. And she said, but how did you find this house? And I said, well, I just typed into Google, your house came up. And she said, well, I don't think this house was an actual underground railroad mm. station. She said, but I do know that the house two doors down was. And for me, because I'm not doing fact-based documentary work, that was fine, because in order to get here, I had to pass by here. Yeah. So, and the one that was known that had a plaque on it, had a big air conditioner hanging out the window, <laughs> you know, aluminum siding had Amazing. been put on it. Yeah. it. It didn't have the kind of timeless quality of history clinging to the place the way that particular uh, house did. So, yeah, no picket fence again. You know, this idea of the white picket fence as a spatial demarcation uh, in American uh, social architecture uh, is, uh, is something that uh, underpins uh, a number of these photographs. And certainly the irony of the white picket fence showing up on a plantation as opposed to the white picket fence showing up in, in a home, a home of someone who was part of the network of fugitivity for you know, African Americans making their escape from slavery. So yeah, you know, I, I, I couldn't make that picture without thinking about Paul Strand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Emily Boone, in her new book about James Van Der Zee, quotes you as a teenager and your reaction to the much criticized Harlem on My Mind show and how that seemed to affected, have affected you at the time. Can you expand at all about what role that played in your journey in photography? Mm -hmm. Respond to what? To Harlem on My Mind. Emily Boone just um, created a book and uh, she cites your response to Harlem on my mind is very critical to you. Yeah, Harlem on my mind is formative for me. Mm -hmm. uh, it has everything to do with 
why I decided to uh, make a photograph. It was the first exhibition that I'd ever gone to see when I was uh, 16 years old. And I won't sit here and, you know, uh, go through the whole history of it, but it was a controversial exhibition that opened at the Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in 1969. That was about Harlem from the turn of the century to 1968. And it was very controversial, so it spilled over into the media and uh, talk radio. And I was a very socially engaged teenager. I mean, it was 1968, 69 in America, very contentious moment. You know, you were either part of the solution or you were part of the problem, as the saying was. And I wanted to be a part of the solution. And I heard about you know, protests going on at the uh, Met uh, around the Heart of My Mind exhibition, which had been put together uh, by the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition, uh, the artist Benny Andrews, and a multiracial uh, group of artists, activists, who were protesting the lack of uh, a lack of a larger inclusive voice in the construction of the uh, Harlem of My Mind exhibition. So I went, and on the day I got there, there was no picket line. So uh, I, I always say that fate conspired that there be no picket lines out front of the Met that day, so that I could go <laughs> in and see the exhibition and see Van Der Zee's work. See Van der Zee, and see photographs hanging on the wall of a museum, yeah. which, I'd never, which I'd never seen before. Mm -hmm. Had the picket line been there, it's, it's, it's a big question mark as to whether I would have gone in. I might, have, I might have asked somebody to give me a picket sign and start marching around myself. I, I don't know what I, what I would have done, but I wouldn't have casually crossed the picket line yeah. to go in and see the show. That, that much I do know. And the experience of going into a museum, uh, finding my way to the Harlem on My Mind exhibition, and for the first time in my young life, seeing photographs of ordinary African Americans on the wall in a museum, with, without knowing it or without being able to articulate it at that moment, it certainly set the trajectory for my own ambition. This idea that photographs of ordinary black people could exist in a museum, in whatever context, because I had no context. I couldn't have, you know, the whole notion of genre, whether it was documentary or whether it was this, or fine art, and it wasn't presented in a fine art context, but I didn't know what a fine art context was. Anyway, my only relationship to museums at that point was through the school visits. You go and you see a blockbuster show, and you see Van Gogh's Starry Night, and then they usher you into the <laughs> gift shop, and you spend a dollar or two that your parents had given you. You buy some souvenir of your visit back on the school bus, and that, that was my relationship to museums at that point. So to walk into a museum and see people like the people in the neighborhood that my mother and father had once lived in. It was uh, a hugely uh, transformative experience. Uh, and between that experience and the fact of my mother and father having met in Harlem were the two things that directly led to my first project being in Harlem. a group of photographs in Harlem mm -hmm. uh, that I then exhibited in Harlem. You know, because the, the choice to exhibit the work at the Studio Museum in Harlem had everything to do with one of the contentious issues around the Met show, which, it was, which was that it was photographs of Harlem shown as, as, as it was described at that time as downtown. Like those of us in the community don't have access to it. It's about us, but it's being shown elsewhere. Uh, and I would, of course, I would have a very nuanced response to that issue. 
uh, from the vantage point of now. But that was the issue. And so when I completed my first project, the question was, so what are you going to do with these pictures? Mm -hmm. Where are you going to show them? Mm -hmm. And with that experience fresh in mind, I knew that I wanted to show them in the community and with their domain. So that the people in the community who were the subjects of the work could also uh, have access to the work. Mm -hmm. So hold them on my mind just yeah. kind of gave my life new meaning, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Okay, two more. Uh, I have a question about the, the Cleveland installation, the church. When did you find it? Who found it? Uh, did that open something for you? Because it was really uh, an exhilaratingly wonderful show, and uh, I don't think people know about it. So would you talk about that a little bit, and how, the place, and what role it played in showcasing that, that project? So he's saying when uh, Night Coming Tenderly Black was first shown on, in, uh, for the triennial, it was shown in St. John's Church. Could you talk yeah. about the, 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 the yeah, well, of, it, uh, it, It's interesting, the, you know, because with all of the projects that I've done, even, even going back to Harlem, USA, that work first lived in the Studio Museum, where it, went, where it meant one very particular thing inside of that community. And then the work goes out into the world. Night Come Intendedly Black was first presented in St. John's Episcopal Church, uh, an installation of that work in a church in Cleveland that had actually been a significant site in the path of fugitivity on the Underground Railroad. It was the last site, the last safe haven for fugitive African Americans uh, before they would make passage to Canada uh, on the other side of Lake Erie. Uh, they would actually go up in the belfry of St. John's Episcopal Church and wait for the signal from Lake Erie before coming down and then going a few miles to uh, Lake Erie. Mm -hmm. So that work and that location, that space, meant something very immediate and resonant. It was history and the place of history. The first, uh, the first white box showing of that work uh, was at the Art Institute of Chicago. And one of the things that I did when the work went to the Art Institute, I wanted to provide a richer context for the work. So uh, in that case, I did two things. I curated an exhibition, a parallel exhibition from the Art Institute's collection of uh, photographs that were, uh, well, the idea for the exhibition was to look at first the way the landscape began to be described and visualized in photography in this country. So I had a few of the Western, you know, uh, survey photographs, and then to also look at the way the black subject came to be visualized in photography. And this is the, one, this is the wonderful thing about doing curatorial projects with encyclopedic museums, because almost anything you might think of in terms of constructing a narrative will be available in the collection. So it looked at the emergence of a certain vocabulary around the American landscape in photography and then starting with uh, Frederick Douglass's, uh, a daguerreotype of Frederick Douglass, who uh, self-authored and on numerous occasions his own portrait. Uh, at one point, some of you may know, Frederick Douglass was the most photographed American in history. He very intentionally authored 
with different photo studios, his image. So I started with the Western Survey and then uh, Frederick Douglass portrait, and then began to look at the way in which the black presence and the black subject began to emerge in the American landscape, to take the landscape and the black subject and to begin to, over the course of history, including uh, some black vernacular photographs, much the way Douglas self-authored his, uh, his image to include some black vernacular photographs that ordinary black folk made of themselves, uh, moving all the way to uh, there was a wonderful photograph by Joel Sternfeld made in this gated community of a group of black domestic workers walking through this beautiful suburban landscape to wait for the bus, and they're in a landscape that is decidedly not theirs, and yet they are momentarily inhabiting that landscape. So I constructed this narrative around the history of landscape representation, history of black representation in photography. The second thing I did, because I wanted to bring some of that church back into the museum, I had Imani Uzuri, uh, a vocalist, composer, and uh, musicologist uh, do a performance in the gallery where the photographs were installed. Uh, I quickly moved the museum from a conversation about having Imani come to do a performance in the auditorium in conjunction with your show. And I was like, no, 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 no. I want Imani do, to do a performance in the gallery with and to the photograph. Let's rethink what a museum can do and be, which is one of my other, I guess, agendas, if you want to call it that, to have museums rethink what they can be in conversation with an artist. So Imani came and did a performance moving through the exhibition space, a performance that she called uh, Wild Cotton. Um, it, it gave sonic and physical presence and resonance to the still photographs on the wall. So this idea of bringing a sonic presence to amplify the history, as well as her quite remarkable physical presence. Mm -hmm. uh, as someone who has uh, both researched and performed very deeply in the area of African-American songs of the antebellum era. Uh, so there was the original context for Night Coming Tenderly Black, and then the museum context. Uh, I'm thinking about how to continue to reshape the presentation of that work as the work continues to go out into the world. You know, uh, in Richmond, it was shown in conjunction with two other projects along with the three-channel video Evergreen and a beautifully darkened, meditative mm -hmm. kind of and it, space. And it had a sonic dimension, which is what you were trying to bring into Night Coming to Nerd. So already thinking through what it meant to animate the space, um, you know, outside of St. John's Church, you know, how do you animate space yeah. to create that psychic level um, so with, with the trilogy, with Elegy, it had a sonic presence because not only did Daoud go to collaborate with Imani with um, Evergreen, she did the soundtrack for that. Yeah. Um, we also have the soundtrack for 350,000, which both created a kind of sonic space within the landscape. Yeah, because the soundtrack and the sonic landscape of the film in the larger exhibition uh, space, those soundtracks became the soundtrack for the work, exactly. the sound of the work, mm -hmm. as it were. Which trailed. So as you yeah. walked into, Follow as you through moved stuff. through, these uh, different, the soundtracks from the different films would trail through. So it had, uh, it was totally encompassed by sound. We have one more question that we want to get to. Um, um, okay. 
Um, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, your work was one of the first things that I formally studied and sort of brought me into photography, so I'm eternally grateful to you for that. But um, I've always wondered, going back to the Richmond Trail, I've always wondered what was your thought process of picking what to shoot, uh, because it mm -hmm. seems to me, I've always read it, and I've, I was always wondering whether you saw each image as its own meaning, or you were always aware of it as a series, as a journey, because that's sort of how I've always thought of it. So just the interplay between like each single image and your awareness of it as a journey, so how you went about picking each scene. Um, I've always been curious about that. Hmm. So first of all, thank you for the work that you've done. It's been a great inspiration for him. And then secondly, thinking about the composition of what would become Stony the Road, how did you choose what particular scenes? Uh, how did you choose the compositions themselves? Uh, the, what comprised the series themselves? How did you make picture? these uh, about picture making? Yes. I mean, it's always it's always a challenge to take an idea and to an idea about a particular place, and then to amplify that idea across the group of pictures. I think with Stony the Road, unlike uh, Night Coming Tenderly Black, which ranged across northeastern Ohio from Cleveland to Hudson, Ohio, where there was a large abolitionist community, or in this here place uh, where there were multiple plantation landscapes that I could move around on, even though I came to center most of the work at Evergreen because it's the most intact plantation landscape in the country. Uh, with the slave trail, it's a very, it's, 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 it's a very narrow space. It's, it's not it's even as wide miles. as this stage. How, it's a how couple wide? of miles long, it's, but the, the more pristine part of it is half a mile. It's not very long at all. It's not. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so how do you take that and give a sense of movement through it? Um, first of all, how do you take that and not make the same picture? Uh, how, which requires certainly looking at that space repeatedly and trying to uh, imagine that space as unfamiliar space where everything in it is now unfamiliar uh, and making photographs from that position, the space of the unfamiliar. If you think about encountering this space, for the first time, and with nothing in this space can be taken for granted. Uh, but Stony the Road was a particularly uh, challenging group of works to make because uh, it was the most spare of landscapes of all of them that really required thinking really deeply and looking very deeply at all of the various pieces and trying to shift positionality in order to represent this space yet again in a different way. So it was, a, it was a, an interestingly and wonderfully challenging project because it was very contained as the experience itself was. It, it was a very contained, restrained kind of experience. With only a couple of miles by, I don't know, five feet wide, maybe four or five feet wide at most. Uh, yeah, so it was, uh, it was challenging. It, it was challenging. Valerie, one more yes. question? One last question. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, you talked about, um, in your process, having trying to create an infrastructure with the institutions and community. If I'm not mistaken, for the Birmingham Project, you worked on that for seven years. Could you talk to me, could you tell us what you were doing for seven years? Go in. 
What was that process? What did you do for seven years to end up with that group of 16 diptychs? He said, you know, the infrastructure, working on projects and the infrastructure is so imperative for the work. Birmingham, if he's not mistaken, took seven years to do. So seven years is a long time. What did yeah, you do I was, seven years? I was in and out of the Birmingham community. A friend of mine told me it was 10 years for my initial contact with them um, to making the photograph. I have to say part of the reason for that was that I was in the midst of the class pictures project, even as I was beginning to visit uh, Birmingham. But the deeper piece of it was I had no idea what kind of work I wanted to make there. And I was going, meeting people who were suggesting, well, why don't you make portraits of the survival of the civil rights movement? Didn't seem interesting or challenging enough. Uh, it took me a long time to figure out the conceptual shape for the making of that work. But by the time I started making that work, I, I had a whole series of relationships in that community, from the barber shops, I mean, you know, because I was hanging out and really becoming uh, a part of that community to the extent where I came to know a lot of people in Birmingham that came to know me, which uh, ultimately was necessary to making that work. But Birmingham in particular, because of the time that I spent doing research there at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute, uh, which then resulted in a kind of partnership between the Institute and the Birmingham Museum of Art. You know, you think about this institutional realignment that kind of underpins the work that I do. But it was only from the research that I started to do at the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute that I became aware of the two boys who had also been killed that day. Mm -hmm. I knew about the four girls. Most people know about the four girls. Uh, most people outside of Alabama, I don't think, know that two young African-American boys were killed on that same day. And that only came out of research. So uh, part of which is to say that I don't go someplace and make work about what I think I know or about what I already know. You know, I try to do enough research that I can be there uh, knowledgeably comfortably, and to also be there with some real integrity, you know, to have a deep enough sense of the place that I can bring some uh, integrity to the work, as opposed to parachuting in and then parachuting out. And then, who's this guy? He's having an exhibition at a museum. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, it, it, it's all part of a process. Uh, and that process, for me, is very much a part of what the work is. It's not just the photograph, but the work as such is that whole uh, process, spending time at the Historical Society uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, and uh, picking their brains until the guy said, man, you're looking to know more than we even know. Good luck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and sent me out to find whatever I could find. He told me, let us know what you find when you come back. You know, because you're talking about making work about a history that was of necessity not known. You know, the path of fugitivity of the Underground Railroad, where the different safe houses, you know, the Underground Railroad station was. Uh, of necessity, those places were not known. Only a handful of them are documented, mm -hmm. you know. And that not knowing is what gave me the freedom and the space to work in the landscape of the imagination and the landscape in proximity to those places. Just like when that woman said, it wasn't my house, it was that one. I said, well, they couldn't get to that one without passing this one. So we're all good, <laughs> you know, because I don't want to just make pictures of the known. Because if you follow that trajectory of only going where the thing was, you, you end up in like a parking lot at, at a CVS somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
where something used to be but no longer is. And, that's, and people have done that kind of, kind of survey work, but, that, but that's not my work. Mm -hmm. So on, on that note, we can wrap okay. that up. I will say, um, yes, Daoud will be reprising a portion of the exhibition at Sean Kelly Gallery. Um, uh, Elegy itself may be seen somewhere. We'll keep you posted on that. Um, we do invite you to the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. We have two incredible exhibitions coming up this summer. Is it this summer or in the fall? Uh, the Long Arc, the fall, the Long Arc, and uh, American Born Hungry uh, will be two exhibitions that will take place. So with that, Dawu, thank you. It's always a well, pleasure to be you. on the stage with you. And thank all of you. Thank you, APAD. Thank you, Aperture. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank <laughs> you.